All right, hello. My name is Maggie. I'm a local singer-songwriter, and I'm also a music major at Mount Holyoke College. So as a music major, I'm a little bit obsessed with music theory, have been for a long time. I think it kind of amused some of my music teachers when I was a kid how excited I would get over like chord names and stuff like that. Um, so a lot of people say that singer-songwriters don't need to know music theory, which is true. You can write music based entirely on intuition, but that intuition comes from years of internalizing patterns you've heard in music theory. Um, and personally, as a songwriter who loves music theory, I find that it helps me break writer's block and find new inspiration all the time. So today, um, I want to bridge that gap. Most college-level music theory classes start by teaching you a set of rules made primarily by Bach and followed by a lot of other classical composers. Um, but pop music often gets exciting when we break those rules or play with them. Uh, so today, I want to show you some examples of ways that pop music plays with music theory. So first off, most pop music is in what we call 4-4 four, four time, which means you hear beats in groups of four, and each beat can be divided by multiples of two. Um, but sometimes we like to put together beats one and two and beats three and four. So instead of four small beats, we have two big beats. This is called cut time. You may have heard it in a song that goes, take on me, take me on, I'll be yours. You hear how it gets kind of twice as long at the end. That's cut time. This is one of the strategies I find myself using a lot in my own songwriting. So for example, I have a song called Windows Down where the chorus goes like this. We've been singing in the car. And then in the bridge, it goes like this. You never know how far you've fallen. So you hear how it gets kind of stretched out. It really makes a nice contrast. So again, most pop music is in 4-4 four, four time, but something really fun happens when we play three notes over the course of four beats. Um, the math does not line up, and so we get this really clashy rhythm. This is what we call triplets against eighths, um, and it adds a lot of drama, especially in pop music. This is something that Bach might have actually used occasionally. So if everyone wants to clap eighth notes with me, and I'm gonna sing a melody with triplets. They're burning all the witches, even if you aren't one. So you hear how the melody does not fit the rhythm, and it creates this like really fun tension. Um, another way we can use something similar to triplets against eighths that's a little more intuitive is in what we call swing time. It comes from swing music, which is a genre of jazz popular in the 30s and 40s. And it's when you divide a beat in half, but then you make the first beat twice as long as the second beat. So really, it's two thirds followed by one third. Um, actually, the trumpet we just heard was in swing time. This also happens in pop a lot. So for example, you know it's harder to find in these times, but I got nothing but love on my mind. If that was straight eighths, it would sound like this. You know it's harder to find in these times, which is so much less exciting. So this is another one that I use all the time. I think it's just so fun and playful and joyful. Um, so I have a song where the guitar part goes like this. I, I just think that adds so much bounce to the song. So that's one of my other favorites to use. Now, um, if you know music theory, or even if you don't, you've probably heard of a key. A key is basically just a set of, of uh, notes that sound good together. If you remember Do, Re, Mi from The Sound of Music, you know that we like to assign a syllable to each of these notes. Um, and Do is what we call the root, because melodies feel complete when they land on Do. So in pop songwriting, we often like to utilize this by ending the chorus on Do, especially, I think, when the title ends the chorus. I think it makes the title more memorable, personally. Um, often will come from a note up one step above Do or a half step below Do. So basically, Re to Do or T to Do is very common. You may have heard Re to Do in songs like, Man, I feel like a woman, Re Do, or Girl, you're amazing, just the way you are, Re Do, or People watching, or even Call me maybe. All of those end in re do. Um, now, 
Tido, you'll hear a lot from Ed Sheeran. Um, for example, I'm thinking out loud, maybe we found love right where we are, or a million more first times, or even, darling, you look perfect tonight. All of that is Tito, or I want love like you made me feel when we were 18, Tito, which is a One Direction song co-written with Ed Sheeran. <laughs> so I want to point out this is not bad or lazy songwriting. This is actually just part of Ed's style. This is how we recognize his songs when we hear them on the radio, even if he's not the one writing them or singing them. And actually, music theory has a ton to do with uh, a writer's voice, as we call it. Um, a lot of songwriters find ourselves drawn to particular keys, rhythms, intervals, even the notes in relation to the chord, the key you're in, makes a huge difference. Um, and so it's, it's part of how we define ourselves. This is why even in a given genre, you might like certain artists more than others. We also have in keys a set of notes that sound good together, which means we also have a set of chords that sound good together. One of those chords in major keys is called the major four chord. And sometimes pop music likes to use the minor four chord, which is fun because it doesn't fit the key and it sounds a little more sad. So for example, there's a song that has two versions and the more energetic version goes, Love him, he's the one, and we shall wed, major four chord. And then the more bittersweet version goes, Love him, he's the one, and minor four. You hear how that's like a little unsettled? I think that's so fun. Anyway, music theory is not just about classical music or jazz. It has a lot to do with pop music and folk music and rock and all those great things. Um, I think it defines an artist's style and it helps people break through writer's block. So my name is Maggie. These are all the places you can follow me and my music and have a great night. Thank you. Please don't focus on the face, as Matt said, focus on the body. So the big C is my topic for this evening, and I'm going to cheat on one side or the other, but this is an experience that I wanted to share for the International Festival of Ideas and Arts. So the big C, or how I celebrated my 65th birthday in Palermo, Sicily. And that's true because you can see my Medicare card right there. And I know several of you, just by the color of your hair, I know you're carrying one in your wallet. I'm gonna have to keep turning because I, I couldn't get these things quite right. So the first C, ah, I see it. The first C, of course, is chiascuro. Where are my Italians? Chiaro, light, and oscuro's dark. So here, Caravaggio, a great Italian artist, is a good illustration of chiascuro. Now, another C, before we get to the big one, is contrapposto. You put your body weight on one, one leg and you get that sexy supermodel S-curve, <laughs> illustrated here by the great maestro Michelangelo. But the big C, I'm gonna have to repeat it three times for you because I just came up with this in Palermo on my 65th birthday, is consapevolezza. Con Sape volezza. You can't really, it doesn't mean anything apart. It just means, consape volezza means in Italian, awareness. That's all it means. So, awareness is what I want you to arrive at because, and I'm going to jump. Ah, you see, picture this Sicily, 1979. A handsome American naval officer right there meets some Sicilian maidens. But that's not really what I wanted to show you. I really wanted to show you the connection to a greater Italian master, this guy, Giacomo Puccini, right? Who doesn't love Madame Butterfly, right? Another handsome American naval officer on the other side of Sicily, I think it's a place called Japan, meets a young maiden. It's kind of like the Miss Saigon story. Well, anyway, somewhere here you're gonna reach consapevolezza. And as we go to the next slide, this is the family story. Back to Sicily. One side, the Filipinos and the Chinese. On the other, right here with my wife, the Irish guys and the, and the Brits, and of course, grandma, 
with a connection to Sicily. Filippa Grotadaria and her husband Giuseppe. So last September, I jumped on a plane, booked an Airbnb and went to Palermo and stayed inside that zone. It's called the Zona Transito Limitato. It's really for the locals. If you have this special sticker, you don't get a ticket. And if you venture into that area with your car, it's a hundred dollar, or excuse me, a hundred euro fine. But while I was walking around that zone one day, I saw this magazine called I Love Italia. As I'm flipping through it, I see this beautiful woman named Lydia Scambri, right? It says there, Le Donne, Le Bellezza delle Donne, right? The beauty of women. And um, I don't think about it, but by chance, as I'm walking around town, the ice cream man introduces me to her. She has a friend from Spain named Ivan Perez, and they're both painters. So I tell them about this idea I have called the three-way dialogue, which has to do with the Philippines, you see the flag there, Cuba and Puerto Rico. Because those were the last three big Spanish colonies that obviously we won after we, we beat the Spaniards. But these three guys don't really talk to each other. The Filipinos, uh, maybe the Puerto Ricans and Cubans do because they share the common language. But anyway, I'm telling them about this terrific artistic idea that I have called the three-way dialogue. But it doesn't register. So I said, all right, let me readjust. I said, Filipinos are great artists. They go to Italy to study the arts. Here, example, great national artist from the Philippines, Guillermo Tolentino. This is called the oblation for the Catholics in the room, meaning the offering, right? So I go back to my Airbnb. I'm racking my brain. I take out the laundry. I hang the three flags. I said, Sylvester, you got to get some inspiration here. You got to get these guys to learn what the three-way dialogue is all about. They still don't get it. Then I say, all right. I love the windows, by the way. Floor to ceiling, right? Can't beat that look. Then I put the three together. Oblazione, Michelangelo over there, and then who's in the middle? The only Filipino guy in Palermo last November. And on my, on my 65th birthday, they decided, we need a model. <laughs> we can't find a Filipino in town. I think you're it. So there we are. First, you have Michelangelo and David. Now you got the guy, the Filipino guy from New Haven in Palermo. <laughs> birthday suit, right? Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. Gracias, Ivan. So this is the fabulous four. So here we are in front of the... Um, the Palermo Museum of Contemporary and Modern Art. The guy in the middle is, um, is a filmmaker, 20 years old, Francesco Di Giuseppe. What better Italian word uh, name can you have? Lydia's there and Ivan is there. So here, I really wanted to be able to highlight the cooperative uh, spirit and work that both Lydia and Ivan did on this particular creation of a new art movement called consapevolezza, awareness. I'm really amazed because usually artists like to work alone, right? They don't really want to share. And here, the week before I left to come back, um, you see Lydia's self-portrait there and one that Ivan painted of her sometime over the summer. Because actually both of them went to the uh, Ac Academy of um, Fine Arts, both in Seville as well as in Palermo. And so again, don't focus on the face. It's the only Filipino here. Focus on the body. La consapevolezza e l'oblazione di un vecchio Filipino. Kidlet the man in Palermo. Mille grazie. Hello, my name is Jer Logan, and I'm going to talk to you about some innovations and activities happening at Make Haven. And so just so you know, Make Haven is a nonprofit organization. We're basically a community workshop with metalworking, woodworking, all sorts of fabrication. We're there to help people uh, have the tools to design, invent, and create. 
Uh, so these are just some uh, different shops we have. This is our wood shop inside of it. We have table saw. Uh, the lathe is something that a lot of people do to make candles and, and other types of things. You can see examples in the corner. Uh, chop saws, a CNC machine that will carve out various uh, shapes, as well as a lot of hand tool work. Uh, with each shop, I wanted to show an example of something cool that happened. And the one I chose in the wood shop is a lute. Uh, this is a member, a musician, who came in and from beginning to end uh, created this beautiful working instrument, uh, carved it in the wood shop, uh, added uh, different details to it, including the laser cut uh, spot where the music comes out. Uh, this takes us to the metalworking shop. Uh, there's all the big tools that you would expect in a metalworking shop, bridge ports, lathes, actually a water jet cutter. You can do welding, and we've recently added uh, jewelry making. Uh, I mentioned that water jet cutter because that is one of the coolest tools we have. It actually uses a stream of water at about 30,000 pounds of pressure and can cut right through a metal plate, stone, whatever you want, it's controlled by a computer. And in this example, they're making blanks of knives that are then uh, you know, sharpened to be useful and have wood handles added to them. So something you can use there. And digital fabrication. Uh, that includes a lot of things, but primarily 3D printers. The bottom you see a sort of a mask shape that's been printed. There's also now resin printers that use ultraviolet light to make ultra high detail uh, type things. And laser cutters, which are using a beam of light to cut out a different shape. And so here's one example of a laser cutter. There's a little miniature of a desk actually made by someone attending here. And then Corey has uh, scaled that up after prototyping it on the larger CNC, computer numeric control machine, to be able to make that little uh, table as a stand for a drawing tablet. And not to forget about textiles, uh, where lots of folks are doing some fun things, including tufting. Uh, this is essentially where you shoot yarn into a, uh, in a cloth to make carpet. Or uh, now we have a, a quilter where you can do very large format with this long, long arm. Um, not to mention there's a, a kitchen, there's a video photography area, and we've added a, uh, an area for learning uh, bioscience and working with biology. So I'm going to mention that as I go through some of our more you know, innovative, future-oriented uh, ideas in the second half of this. But what I want to mention is that integrating all these ideas is what is important. So one example of that is the Robo Dominators, which are our first robotics robot building competitive team. And they have been able to 3D print. They've been able to machine out metal parts, uh, develop things with electronics, and use the water jet cutter to make those different parts. Another one was when COVID uh, was in, in full gear and we thought we needed ventilators. We actually built a prototype ventilator built on open source technology. We used a water jet cutter. We bent the metal up. We used casting and mold making to make the plunger and then electronics to pull it all together and actually came up with a, a first prototype, which fortunately was not needed. Um, and this brings me to uh, work we're doing with Gather New Haven, which is to bring the environmental entrepreneurial prototyping ideas together. So they received some funds to do a pilot six month program uh, with 18 to 25 year olds where they will be doing environmental education and working with Make Haven to learn about prototyping. So they'd be using the water jet cutter to test designs. They'd be using the mill for uh, rapid iterations of different inventions as well as the 3D printer, and having access to the volunteers and the work we're doing with uh, bio. So you see some injection molding and even some bio material there. So injection molding is plastic, and uh, that doesn't sound good for the environment, but we're doing something with precious plastics where you can recycle uh, plastic. So that's an oven you see where you have two plates that heat and compress something. And the other tool on the side, the vertical one, is an injection molder. So that takes and melts plastic and shoots it into a cavity uh, that you've milled out on a machine so that you can mass produce parts. And what sort of things could you make? Well, these are examples that are in the larger larger precious plastics ecosystem. So there's a bunch of communities where people are uh, gathering plastic and then putting them together in unique ways to create artisan prod products. 
Um, then you get into electronics. So we have obviously got a lot of people interested in all the various types. These are several different platforms that are now available to people and can be programmed. The bottom one actually being uh, a set of sensors that were built by one of our members, which actually evolved uh, into a sensor kit which gets deployed. You can see that uh, you would deploy that in many different environments, for example, in the river to de detect the amount of salt, uh, the transparency. Uh, we've also been working with a whole collective in New Haven to put up little antennas that are long range and can receive data from all of these different sensors. Um, these are all things that we think could be incorporated. Uh, I mentioned that there's different materials. One interesting materials taking, uh, say, sawdust or grain or coffee grounds, adding a mushroom, which has these roots called mycelium, which bind the material together. You then cook it so it's no longer alive, and you have a foam plastic-like material. Uh, so you can see some examples here, some like packing. Lots of people are uh, doing this different places, but the little Lego man and the others uh, you see in the big picture are made at Makehaven as we are testing the uh, how this process would work and uh, how it would work with things like what was in our shredder versus uh, sawdust and so on. So those are some hints of uh, what we do at Makehaven, some hints of what we might be doing in the future with Gather New Haven Innovation in the Environment. Uh, you can learn more at that URL, uh, learn about Makehaven, or see pictures on Instagram. Thank you so much for your time. Hi. Short people. Um, uh, my name is Ami Zeiner, and uh, my presentation is called, We Live Among Them. <clears throat> I've planted trees in every place I've lived since I was seven years old. My first tree was a weeping willow from a cutting I rooted in a jar. I went back to visit it after more than half a century. It was taller than the house and still in its youth. Now I try not to fall in love with any trees in case they get cut down. I don't mourn the natural death of a tree, but men in the sound of chainsaws in the spring. I met a woman at Bishop's in the apple orchard in the gala tree rose, a complete stranger. She looked at me and said, our mothers would be so pleased to know we were picking apples. I nodded and I couldn't help bursting into tears. It was true and beautiful and I missed my mother. The woman hugged me and she cried. There we were weeping in the beautiful apple orchard women and trees <laughs> tree of knowledge genus malus pomum arboris tree of life photosynthesis chlorophyll mitochondria sacred tree bodai tree of awakening sacred oak grove of the druids la abuela sieba la centania from celtic lore what are the seven sacred trees? Oak, ash, hazel, apple, alder, elder, yew. Treed prey, hanging tree, Christmas tree. Tree limb, timber tree. Keystone tree. Tree of heaven, Iolanthus altissima. Tree diagram, bark up the wrong tree. Round and round the mulberry tree. In the east, the mulberry is the link between heaven and earth. You're up a tree. You're out of your tree. The Charter Oak, Quercus Alba, our state tree. Now you know that 600 different types of oak trees exist around the world. Oak trees, tree top, close as the bark to the tree. 
can't see the forest for the trees. She charmed the birds from the trees. Bark, phloem, xylem, pulp, heartwood. Lit up like a Christmas tree. Fell out of the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. Go climb a tree. Money doesn't grow on trees. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Like nailing jello to a tree. Go live in a tree. Rooted like a tree to the same place. Root, trunk, limb. Tree colony, tree stand, tree farm, tree house, cone, burr, fruit, samara, akin. From the tiny acorn doth grow the mighty oak. Branch, twig, stem, petiole, bud, rooted like a tree to the same place, root, trunk, limb. Largest civ living single thing on earth is a stand of quaking poplar. 47,000 trunks, 13 million pounds, 106 acres, one root system. Populus tremuloides. Tree hugger. Tree hugger. <laughs> Tree hugger. Tree hugger. We live among them. Thank you. I'm Babs Rawls Ivy. Oh, I'm tall. <laughs> tall. I'm Babs Rawls Ivy. So I moved to uh, New Hallville because I lost my house in Beaver Hill. And uh, I inherited a porch that I didn't know what to do with. I wasn't even thinking about the porch. I was just thinking I needed a place to live. And so I took this picture. But I wanted my, I knew that people were nervous that I had lost my home and they thought something was going to happen. So I said, let me, let me, just, let me just enjoy the ch porch. So the first thing you do when you build a porch, you put a damn chair and a candle. That's what you do, because you're like, I'm going to sit out there. Didn't think anybody else was going to sit out there with me. I was just going to sit out there, because this was the rocking chair I rocked my newly adopted newborn baby in. So that's the rocking chair. So I said, well, we'll put it on the porch. And then you know what you do? You add one chair, you add two chairs, and then a table. One, two, three chairs, tables. And then you got a sort of living situation on a porch. And so that was the beginning of, wow, there's something to this. 
porch kind of vibe, I could make an outside living space. So then uh, my brother stopped by. <laughs> He's cute. He works for Public Works. <laughs> And he just like relaxed and he brought some beers, although you don't see the beers. But he said, he's like, this feels like a living room. I was like, I know, doesn't it? He's like, yeah, what are you gonna do with it? I was like, well, it's, I'm, we're doing it. We're sitting on the, I don't know, what else should I do? So then, you know, I add my squad, my girlfriends. These are some of my best girlfriends on the planet. And so we started taking dinners and hanging out on the porch because community. So I started to get the sense that this was very romantic. Romantic in the sense that we're building community in an unlikely place that people don't think about community. That's my squad. And so this is like any given night. Any given night in New Hallville at 75 Ivy Street, you would find us drinking, smoking, drinking, <laughs> eating, delivering food, because we were in the midst of a pandemic. And what are you going to do when you can't really be inside? So look, the party gets bigger, right? The light stays on, it attracts more people. And so we, I started catering stuff. I had, <laughs> swear to God, we had, uh, I had Steven, Chef Stephen Ross come and make food on the porch. I had, uh, <laughs> I had um, um, soup made on the porch. Those are my brothers, cute brothers. So they sitting on the front porch because that's what you do when you're in community. You sit on the front porch and you talk to people when they walk by. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey, how you doing? Tell me about your day. And that's how we started to begin momentum of curing loneliness amongst ourselves. So then you, not only do you just have folks, you have positive, powerful conversation with powerful black women. Y'all know that's Robin Porter and Karen DeBose Walton and Sharon McCain. You know, what happens on the porch stays on the porch. So I can't tell you what we was talking about. <laughs> Because rule number one, first rule of porch club, you don't talk about porch club. <laughs> so then I decided, well, I have to make this a beautiful place for people to be. So if you notice in the first few slides, it was sparse. But look, there's a damn rug, <laughs> flowers, <laughs> pillows. People started bringing pillows. People started bringing stuff that said, like, what happens on the porch stays on the porch, porch life. And then I had a wedding. And they still live happily ever after. Like, I married two couples on my porch. <laughs> Swear to God. I had a cake, flowers, music, the whole nine. You don't need to go to Vegas. Just come to 75 Ivy Street. <laughs> I will marry you because I'm a justice of the peace, a legit justice of the peace. And they're still livingly, living happily ever after. Tom Breen and Lucy Gelman. <laughs> what I build, no man will tear asunder, let me tell you. It was a beautiful fall day, probably one of the warmest fall days that we ever had, and I married them. Oh, did I mention that the porch acts as a concert space? <laughs> so uh, Chris Randall suggested that I uh, use the porch as a place to have concerts. So this wonderful woman was one of the arts and ideas when they were doing, you know, you could uh, pay for an artist to come play. So she came and played. And then I had another man come and play romantic songs for my great love, Andrew Kaplan. It was his birthday, so we had a birthday on his porch. And I had this man come and play romance songs via guitar. Baby, you ain't lived until you heard guitar music romance. That's my sister Lo, who is from uh, Piscataway, New Jersey, who is the wind beneath my wings. And that's my Moroccan book because next year I'm spending Morocco, my 60th birthday in Morocco with 20 of my closest friends. <laughs> so I wanted to show that because the porch looks very house and garden. And if that's not enough, I started a fund and I launched it from the porch. I started a fund to, to help women coming home from prison have access to cash. That's all I wanted to do. So I launched it, I launched it from the porch with some of my close friends who were down in the struggle with, uh, with uh, helping me do this work. Oh, Santa comes too. And if you know, it's a black Santa because we do black Santa at my house. <laughs> so black Santa sits on the porch all year round because Santa, black, Santa. And, I, and he's like kind of gnomish, but fabulous. So he sits on the porch all summer 
And then what would a porch be without black girl magic? It's a real thing for y'all don't know. Forget what you heard, it's a real thing. The McBride sisters are two black women who created this wonderful wine. And uh, this is the sparkling black girl magic, but they have, re well, girl, yes. Although that's a little too sweet for my taste. And, it, and if you think we don't have glamor and fun, this was my birthday. So this is Patty Russo, who, if y'all know Patty Russo, she is the queen of boas. So she shows up at my party with all the boas, and that's me on my birthday celebrating with her and, and a zillion friends with champagne and cupcakes. And this, my friend, is the sum of all things. Community built, community loved, community supported. This is how you cure loneliness. You turn on the light on your porch and you invite people to come and you make them feel welcome. And it doesn't matter if you're in the hood or an affluent neighborhood. Love is love and community is yours. I'm back. That's a boomerang joke. My name is Paul Sprague. I'm with the Wandering Nutmeg Boomerang Society. And in six minutes, if I'm successful, you're going to turn to the person next to you and say, I've just caught my first boomerang. So we're passing out materials. Uh, some of them are put together, and uh, some of them you'll have to stick together. Take two pieces, and uh, we have stickers. And you're going to stick them together into an X like this. OK? Now, I know what you're thinking, which is this doesn't look like a boomerang, but this does, right? Everybody can agree this is an actual boomerang. This is from New South Wales, uh, built about 1950. And uh, what makes it a boomerang? It's got two wings. It's got some aerodynamics happening. But what really makes this a boomerang is when I throw this, it goes out about 50 meters and comes back, and I can catch it. That makes it a boomerang. Boomerangs don't have to have two wings. This is one that I made for uh, 3D printing, where if you don't like the way it works as a three blader, you can snap in another wing. So it's modular. Uh, it's built for small, uh, small 3D printers. Boomerangs don't have, uh, have to have a certain shape, but they do have to have a planar distribution of mass. So in other words, you don't want it to tumble this way. You want it to spin this way. All right, so as long as the mass is spread out on a flat plane, then you can use that shape to make a boomerang. But it's not actually flat. Because if you look at this carefully, built into the shape of this, it's got, and it's kind of subtle, you can see it. This is a photo of, of this on the top here. It's actually bent upward. Okay, This is called a positive dihedral. And we're going to do this on our little cardboard four bladers. And the way we do that is we're going to bend them up slightly. Okay. And uh, you don't want to give it too much, but you do want to have a, a little bit of upward bend, okay, about a third of the way down. And it's going to look almost flat, but, but it does have to be bent up just a little bit, okay? The second design element we're going to take from this is if you look at the, the shape of the airfoil, it's actually undercut, carved into the shape of this. There's, a, there's an undercut on the leading edge. And this is something that uh, airplanes do when they're getting ready to take off. They angle their wings down. That's for a more aggressive airfoil so they can get more lift and get into the air. So we're going to do this on our cardboard four blader. And this is where we separate the righties from the lefties. So I throw a righty and I'm going to twist mine with a little bit of positive angle of attack on all four wings. Okay. Again, it doesn't have to be very much, but it has to be there. And the more twist you give it, the shorter the flight is going to be. This is going to go uh, between one and two meters. So a type of boomerang that we use in competitions um, is a, uh, this is a uh, low flying 20 meter boomerang, 20 meters being the minimum distance requirement for most competitions. So these have pretty high angle of attack because you want it to go out, come back low and, and you can catch it. Uh, a boomerang that has a very low angle of attack is the high flyers. So this is a low flyer. These are the high flyers. And we had a guy throw one of these and catch it 17 minutes later. If you catch a thermal, you watch where the hawks fly, seriously. And it'll, it'll just stay up there and coast. Um, so that's uh, low flyers. These are the high flyers. These are ultralights. 
And next I'm going to show you the long flyers. Um, so a long distance boomerang, if you look at the materials here, I've got aluminum and carbon fiber and oak with lead weights in it. So these are, uh, again, low profile airfoils, but they're very dense. And these will fly 100 meters plus, which is out of sight, and then they'll, and then they'll come back and you can catch them. Now a boomerang is thrown, a lot of people try and throw it like a, like a frisbee, but they're actually thrown vertically, straight over, okay? And when they come back, they're gonna be, you throw them vertically and they come back flat. And they do that using an effect we call gyroscopic precession, okay? Same force that keeps a bicycle in the air or, or from falling over and so forth. So what happens is the, the spin center, it's spinning like this, the spin center rotates from the airfoils because it takes it to the side, and then the precession makes it lay down flat. So when I throw this, this goes out the first 20 or 30 meters, it's going pretty much straight. It's gonna to start to curve to the, to the left because this is a right-handed boomerang. It's gonna, once, once it starts to turn, then it's gonna precess, okay? It's gonna lay out flat. Now the airfoils are pointed upward, so it's gonna rise and it reaches a high point at uh, about 50 meters, this one, and then it'll coast back and then hover down for a, for a flat catch. So that's what makes it boomerang. Why would a sane person do this? I'm not personally qualified to answer that exact question, but I'll tell you why I do this. Um, I was at a birthday party last month for an eight-year-old girl, and um, when she caught her first boomerang, it was a great moment, and her face looked like that, okay? That's why I do boomerangs, okay? And this is what we're gonna try and create here tonight. So I'm gonna give you, don't throw your boomerang yet, but we're getting close, all right? I'm gonna give you a countdown. First, we gotta go through our pre-flight checklist. So we wanna make sure that um, it has a small amount of positive dihedral, and if it was flat, maybe enough to roll a pencil under the, under the end, it's gonna have a tiny bit of positive angle of attack for your throw. And if you look at it, it should look almost flat, but slightly turned up. And we're gonna throw it vertically, a quick snap. Is everybody ready? Three, two, one, throw. <laughs> Who caught theirs? Hold it up if you caught it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and many happy returns. Cunningham. I graduated from East Sun's class of 2021. Woo! Woo! I was born in New Haven. I've been in New Haven. I've been here all my life, so there's a lot of things I've seen and even done. So May 6, 2021, I was made youth ambassador at the Shack. Woo! Yeah, Woo! yeah. <laughs> so if you're wondering what the Shack is, it's a community center that is currently under construction after being uh, granted. $550,000 from the state of Connecticut to rebuild a community center. So for my senior project, I had to do something good for the community, you know, an act of kindness. So I decided I was going to create a community garden. So, yeah. I decided I wanted to do this garden. I showed my mother the plan. She showed Alder Hamid Smith the plan, uh, War 30. And I went to 3 3 Valley Street with a folder full of papers to meet with Miss Honda. So with the help of volunteers, my dream of a community garden turned to reality. 12 garden beds were made. Uh, the garden beds consisted of eggplants, red peppers, green peppers, squash, a whole lot of other things. And uh, during the summer of 2021, Alder Smith hooked me and my friends up with the job. So American actor, director, martial artist, Michael J. White was our motiv motivational speaker of the day. After the speech, he spoke to me and two other friends privately on a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And he spoke on his childhood life and it mirrored the uh, childhood life of me and my friends today as youth. 
So he explained to us there was more to life than what we were doing because we were just hanging around. And so that conversation changed my life for the better. But the fun started once the community and volunteers helped clean the shack out and repaint the walls after being closed for 30 years. My father and I got the honor to paint the shack and we got to paint my favorite room in the shack, which is the game room. Which, and the game room now consists of pool table, game consoles, TV, ping pong, and even an old school arcade full of games I never heard of because I wasn't alive. <laughs> so, my father's a professional painter, probably the best painter you'll ever come across. And we were blessed to have him on our team. So he finished painting that whole room less than an hour. And, as my father worked, uh, Miss Honda expressed her gratitude to my father and how, how thankful she was to have him. And around Miss Honda, you'll feel the love. And especially being at the shack, you'll feel the love. And so I would say, nothing happens overnight. You know, you have to write the plan down, implement the plan, and tell the right people to plan so they can help you carry it out. You know, patience is key. You have to trust the process, and you have to respect the game. You have to show up to practice, share your ideas and the things you know with your team. Show them you are serious. Show the people you want to win. Transition is hard, but with lots of planning, we can see our futures through pathway careers such as becoming an attorney, doctor, EMT, musical engineer, financial literacy. You know, those are some of the programs we'll have at the shack, actually. And although I wasn't like my Ronald Augustine Sr., who was one of the original leaders at the shack, I didn't have his vision or his plan then, but working and planning with the team, we now see the full vision of the shack, which is to uh, bring all ages under one place for much needed services. As the youngest member of the team, I learned that dedication and persistence is the key that unlocks many doors. One of those doors we unlocked was to honor the fallen heroes of the community, and that was Steezo, former resident of Brookside. He was a Grammy Award winner for his music, but we lost him three years ago due to heart problems, so we honor him on our wall in the game room. After the shack was filled with new item ranges from couches, chairs, and desks, I decided to invite some friends over to the shack so they can get a taste of what we had planned. They played pool, giant connect four, and at the end of the night, we ordered a huge pizza and enjoyed each other's company. As a youth ambassador, the first, I, the first event I did was Friendsgiving. The room was full of laughter, love, and a diversity of people. Volunteers at the shack served against food and drink. Speakers came out and they talked to kids about stocks and they taught them about Bitcoin. During the month of December, the shack, the shack staff were very supportive of me and my Christmas event for friends and family. I had an opportunity to play games, take pictures, and eat. We did a gingerbread house contest and Tati, she was actually one of the winners. That's why. In the previous slide, she was smiling so hard. <laughs> so you said, hey, Con, me and uh, Hon Miss Honda Smith playing is definitely my favorite. The community was all in with this event. We had a variety of donations from candy, money, baskets, and toys. We decided that we'll put toys out along with the candy so we could get the children to come out. So we served hot dogs and hamburgers. We had an ice cream stand in the inside. Ruben Ortiz. Yeah. Okay, Ruby Ortiz created a community artwork project to connect West Hills and Westville Village together in a community artwork project. Through this project, our community was able to connect with residents from our surrounding communities. Through the painting mural that is displayed on Blake Street before Nanta Valley Street, which is a beautiful sight to see with the, uh, with the collaboration with the Yale School of Fourth Street and Vox Church, we were able to weed out and create space for our new shrubbery to be planted around our meditation garden. With the help of volunteers, and uh, that was another amazing experience. Working with this group and community volunteers, meeting new people and learning new things I didn't know before. The Shack has created endless opportunities for everyone, including myself. So as residents of New Haven, we must help push the agenda of the Shack, which is to prepare youth, adults, seniors, and families for successful lives. Tearing down the old and building the new, the Shack is back and we're in full effect. Something I've been waiting for. You know, there's no more hanging out with nothing to do. Me and my friends can bring our skills and our thoughts to the shack and create a life for ourselves and those around us. Right. I always seen the good in everything and everyone. You know, you give me a rock, I'll bring it to life, you know. Living in the middle of the madness may force you to pick a side, you know, get down and lie down, you know. Not me though, I have bigger plan. I didn't know the exact plan. I just know I wanted to win. Cause you know, winners wins. Losers lose, so sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Not me though, I set to the rules. 
about two weeks ago, June 6th, I was in the garden, and it was a day of my friend funeral who was murdered last month. He was shot twice in his chest. So, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make the funeral, so I sat in the back in the garden, and I noticed there was more wildlife in the back, more than ever. You know, I looked across the field, there was a ground hole. Every single garden was full of butterflies, so I took that as, like, just to keep living and accomplish more things for my friend Ant since his life was cut short. And that's it. Thank you. Being a spiritual being in a physical existence is quite an invention. Here's a little mind experiment to help set the stage for tonight's story. If you'd like to try it, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and start listening to the thoughts in your head. You know, thoughts like, I don't want to close my eyes. Do I really need to close my eyes? It's a slideshow. Why am I closing my eyes? I need to pee. I'm hungry. I don't hear any thoughts when I listen to my thoughts. Hmm, that is a thought. I'm going to peak. How much longer? In other words, normal thoughts that you might find yourself thinking every day. Now, just for a moment, even if you think you can't, believe that you can stop thinking for a moment. Stop thinking for a second and take a look at what's there when you're not thinking. Who or what is there when there are no thoughts? Now on to our story. This is a story of love and fear. It's both a love story and a horror movie. Once upon a time in a dimension far away, there were two dimensions actually, one existing inside the other. One was a physical dimension called Egoville. The other was a larger non-physical dimension called Loveland. Everyone in Loveland was part of a non-physical, peaceful, loving, indescribably beautiful, blissed out eternal energy. All the beings shared the same consciousness existing as one is a kind of collective consciousness. It was, in a word, lovely. <clears throat> Egoville. Egoville, on the other hand, was inhabited by physical beings who, like us, lived in physical bodies. Egoville was a nice place on many levels, but it was both fun and horrifying, kind of like a carnival ride through a house of horrors at an amusement park on our planet. The problem was, there was something about Egoville that caused the people there to be fearful and plagued by incessant negative thoughts of worry and fear. They were horribly harassed and tormented by unrelenting negative and fearful thoughts, and they suffered greatly. It was a life and death struggle for many as insanity was common and escapism and denial rampant. They tried all sorts of things to escape the mental torment. They banged both their heads against the wall. Yes, they had two heads in order to inflict pain on themselves as a distraction from the mental torture. They developed bizarre beliefs and rationalizations like the suffering they endured was good for them. Pain builds character, and things aren't so bad. Most Egovillers had given up hope of finding relief from the constant mental torture. Then one day, some guy named Ralph realized that if he stayed very still and turned his attention deep within himself and away from his thinking, he could hear another voice in his head a kinder voice. He could hear the sky people. The sky people were emissaries of Loveland sent to help, kind of like angels. Ralph told many of his friends and they too learned to hear the sky people. The sky people spoke to them with a kind voice from deep within and told them the story of their past and how ego villagers had forgotten their true identity and where they had come from. Sky people told them that their physical dimension of Egoville was actually a bubble of time that they had created within the Loveland dimension. And if they wanted, they could return to Loveland. It seems that Egovillers were originally from Loveland, that they had started Egoville thinking it would be better. As the story goes, long ago in a time before time, some part of Loveland. As the story goes long ago and a time before time, some part of Loveland wondered what it would be like to be individual physical beings. At first it was just a thought of what their individual selves would look like. 
then that thought of their form or ego, as it was called, became physically real. At first, it was quite an adventure. They enjoyed the tactile experience of their new forms and were able to move back and forth between the dimensions. But in time, they got so involved with their new physical dimension, they forgot where they came from, and they got stuck in physical reality and their fearful thinking inside of their heads. They had become separate, or so they thought. And being separated from the love of Loveland was the cause of their fear and relentless, fearful thinking. While they liked the Sky People's invitation that they could return home to their source, they also realized that they were afraid to return to Loveland. Eagle Villers had come to believe that being physical was all they were. They feared they would not survive if they returned to the non-physical Loveland. The Sky People assured them that they could return to Loveland and continue to exist because the energy of Loveland is what they were made of, and that energy was eternal by its nature. In fact, being the same as that eternal loving energy meant they really had nothing to fear or defend against. They were not really separated. It just appeared so. At their core, they were still the love of Loveland. It's what they were made of. It could never change. They were ironically defending against themselves. Ego builders realized they actually had a choice between two dimensions, one based on love and one based in fear. They realized they had to remember to consciously choose between the fearful thinking in their heads or the peaceful energy deep within. Because if they didn't choose, their ego self would automatically choose fearful thinking. It seems that ego villers unconsciously chose fearful thinking in a misguided attempt to protect their physical selves. The constant mental harangue kept them from facing their fear of exploring their true identity as non-physical lovelanders where they feared they would cease to exist. As the story goes, more and more ego villers began to understand that they were eternal beings from Loveland. They learned by choosing to remember to align with the love energy within themselves, they could gain access to the peace and love of Loveland. This changed their experience in Egoville from one of suffering to one of peace. They came to know that they were made of an eternal, peaceful, and loving energy. And because of that, ultimately, there was nothing to fear or defend against. Eventually, all the people from Egoville understood this and returned to Loveland. They came to be the consciousness beyond their thinking that they all shared. And yes, they lived happily ever after. So I'm here today to present a portion of my dissertation, um, hopefully in August. traumatic so I'm, I'm starting now um, so over the past years we've seen the uptick in suicide in those of our law enforcement um, those are our firefighters in the context in which we see in the USA Today's article I'll go through it in USA Today's article we see that individuals have horrific nightmares and sometimes those dreams can't get out of their heads but the context in which we talk about it is very unique but when we talk about how black men the rise of suicides for them there's a different conversation about what it means to live in a society that does not love you, that potentially may hate you or fear you. And it's not just black men, it's black kids. Black kids are thinking about their future, their lack of future, their lack of self-worth, spaces like education, bless you, that do not care for you. And it becomes a difficult process for them to think about what the future may look like for them when there are other inundated messages that say they're not successful. I'm caught in the story about Khalif Browder, who was incarcerated and held in solitary confinement for 70 days. He was innocent, and when he was finally released, he killed himself. Bryce Gowby, five-star athlete from Georgia Tech, he ended up living in poverty with his family. Lived in poverty with his family, he committed suicide in the train tracks. The story in my work focuses on how do black men understand their lives? How do they understand survival? And all the black men talk about the fear of living in society. And they do more, and they talk about what it means to not be cared for and not be loved for. The challenges that a lot of the black men talk about is this paradoxical thing about what it means to be killed 
to walk in a society that at any time a small incident can be elevated so quickly. And they think about it geographically, where I'm at, sundown towns. Where do I feel safe? Black criminality. We see pipeline to prison in our schools. Those that are school counselors. They try to work against a system where there's a misunderstanding that's happening in the classrooms about who can be successful and who can. Which identities actually matter? Where should I be? We see the uprising, and so some of the, in the clinical space, we talk about when the killing happened, it affected other world in a very unique way. But it affected black men in a very unique way when they saw themselves, they saw their sons, they saw their cousins falling victim on a consistent basis, and their response turned to rage. Now here's the conversation. Do black men have the emotional vocabulary? Do men have the emotional vocabulary to support themselves? Because we have mixed emotions, but our masculinity says that emotions don't matter. Our workspaces say that they don't matter. And that becomes the trouble part because we have a runaway train. So what do we do with depression? What do black men do with depression? We cope. We say coping is they're bleeding. They're in pain. They have nowhere to go to. They don't feel comfortable going to counselors. They don't feel comfortable dealing with the medical industry. So what do they do? Many of them fall into two things. Aggression, rage, athletics. My work specifically says that for those that participate in athletics, the bigger, stronger, faster, you, you participate in a system that heightens a societal fear. And it also forces you to sit in your aggression. We did a study with some of the individuals that were talking about therapy, the medical space. It's a book called Medical Apartheid. The individuals never knew, but there was an intergenerational history for a lot of them about counseling emotions, things that came from their fathers and their grandfathers. They said, we don't talk about this. We call it the Brunos. We don't talk about Bruno. With those that type of kids in contact. <laughs> we don't go to therapy because it's going to make me weak. But we started to talk about how can we be successful in the midst of vulnerability. Because the vulnerability that many of the men were experiencing shook them shook them to their core they would hide in silence they would isolate themselves to a point that some have thought about suicide have thought about different opportunities the fear of having children was a challenge for them one man said that his he has a hard time looking at his reflection not because he actually did anything but because he he thought that someone may have a perception about him that he would spend his lifetime trying to prove that he wasn't. He was having a midlife crisis when he was 20. What we did also find is that there is a hope as they start talking about the emotions and what changed their life. Fatherhood. Having, have, being a parent. Investing your time in your children. But in the picture, we see the children have bruised eyes. We talk about school. School was an opportunity for them to change yourself, create a new identity on large main campuses, but they still were balancing, balancing identities in space. Where am I allowed to be my full self? Am I important? Can I be important? These larger questions for these individuals. So individuals graduate and they get jobs <coughs> and they mentor and it still meant nothing. They ended up raising another group of kids where they would tell them to be just as tough as they were because they were trying to save them. They said they started participating in a cycle even they thought they were doing better. Same thing with the family. The wife was a, was a cornerstone. The love and the care opened up their hearts for the first time. But they were afraid to cry in front of their wives and established families. It was a duality that was happening in the household that was perplexing. And then lastly, we talk about coping strategies and now in the counseling space, we do see some of the counselors having conversations about religion and counseling and how they work in tandem. But 
individuals have a hard time going to altar call now. And so as they kind of progress, hopefully they get to a point where when altar call comes and they're called to do their purpose, they feel more complete. Thank you. I'm eight years old and living in Brooklyn, New York. It's 1964. My grandma, who I called Baba, I said to her, I want a dog more than anything in the world. Baba was a petite woman with brown hair and she wore a plural babushka. She said, Ninochka. Next door in the gasoline station, they just got a German shepherd. They're not treating him very well. He doesn't have enough food, and he doesn't have any place to sleep at night. I'm going to adopt him, and I'm naming him Brownie. Now, we lived in a two-family house over an antique store. My grandmother lived on the first floor, and me, my mother, my father, my two sisters lived on the second floor. Now I had really good access to this dog, but I didn't want part share of a dog. I wanted the dog to myself. The dog liked Baba, but he chose her common-law husband, Nunzio Mazzelli, as his master. Nunzio had a Roman nose, bushy eyebrows, and a five o'clock shadow that came way too early. He worked in a piano store all alone. Brownie decided he needed him the most. And I visited the store many times after school, and I used to pretend I knew how to play the piano. I was in the back room having a snack, and I heard Nunzio pick up the phone. $10 on number 12, please, and I saw him write something in a book. The front door had jingle bells, and I heard it ring. Two men wearing felt hats and gray suits walk up to Nunzio and says, Nunzio, your loan is due. Pay up. He said, oh, can I pay you in a few days? They shook their heads. They bent their knees. They raised their fists. And then Brownie came over, and he barked, and he growled, and he showed his teeth. I've never seen him look so ferocious. And the men said, uh, uh, we'll come back. That night, Nunzio and Brownie came home to the smell of steak, escarole, and garlic. And Nunzio sat in his favorite living room chenille chair, pulled over a, a marble table, had one bite, and then take the next piece and tossed it to Brownie, who's standing in attention. And Brownie caught it right away and yelled. And Nunzio said, Brownie, what a good boy you are. The next day, Nunzio said he was going to go to a job in New Jersey and that he and Brownie were going to be away the whole day. And so the next morning, I ran to our second floor landing, and I looked down, and I saw Nunzio and Brownie barreling down the staircase. Then I ran to the front of the house and saw the station wagon pull away. Well, that evening, Nunzio returned, and his eyes were red, and they were swollen. He said, I was parked at the meter in the front and I called Brownie. He usually sleeps on a long ride and he wasn't there. I think that when I stopped at the toll booth by the George Washington Bridge on the New Jersey side, he must have left the back and went for a leak. I must have passed through the toll booth and ran across the bridge without him. I can't believe I lost Brownie. And he held his hands in his, his head in his hands and he sobbed. For days, I helped Nunzio search for Brownie in all the five boroughs. I looked out the side window. We didn't give up hope, but nine days 
the nuncio started to lose his energy. He wasn't a well man. And so our family recognized that it wasn't going to happen. On day 10, I was outside the house and looked to the side. There was Brownie limping towards me. And I hugged him. And I said, Brownie, you're home. And I ran to the hallway and yelled, Baba, you're not going to believe this. Brownie is home. And Baba came down, and she turned over his paw. And it was red and swollen. And it was so messed up. She ran upstairs, and she called Nunzio. I ran to the sink that was on the ground floor to get him a big bowl of water. Nunzio came. Brownie stood up. He was laying down, and he limped to, Brown, to Nunzio, and they held each other in this big man hug, and they swayed from side to side, and Nunzio said, Brownie, what a good boy you are. What a good boy you are. And Brownie said, oh, woo. They had a lot of trouble, Brownie and Nunzio, walking up the stairs. He went to his favorite chenille chair and sat down, and Nunzio put his head on his lap to say, Nunzio, I'm here. Don't worry, I'm here. I'll never leave you again. Seeing this, I realized I didn't want to have a dog. I wanted a dog that chose me, just like Brownie chose Nunzio. Two months later, Nunzio was taken to the hospital, and he didn't return. He died of cancer. Nun the Brownie walked and walked in Baba's apartment, whining, looking for him. And then he put his head on the chenille chair that Nunzio loved. And then he picked it up. And he looked at me. And I thought, maybe he'll choose me. But then he walked right up to Baba. He barked. He stood on his hind legs, put his hands on his shoulder, and licked her face. He chose Baba because she needed him the most. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lara Herskovich, and I want to reflect tonight with you about escaping the circus, because let's face it, we're all a part of many circuses. These are different. I'm so fascinated about what's about to come next now. We're part of lots of different circuses. Some of them are healthy and happy. Some of them are unhealthy. I want to talk about escaping a circus that is not healthy. In my life, those circuses have looked like a relationship that never really worked, or a work environment where my core values were in conflict, or maybe a culture that tells me I'm not enough. What these things have in common, the common thread, is that I feel like I'm moving forward. I can feel the wind on my face. I can see things going by. I know I'm moving, but I'm actually going around in circles. I know I have to escape that kind of circus, and if I just focus on the risks, of leaving an unhealthy circus, it feels a lot like this. If I'm just focused on the risks, that's when all the voices of self-doubt and fear arise. But in those moments when I know I need to escape an unhealthy circus that won't change, if I can remember to focus on the rewards of escaping, then I can start to imagine vibrancy and wonder and surprise and magic and a possible future that's much healthier than where I am. If I can remember to focus on the rewards of escaping an unhealthy circus, my quiet, whispering heart remembers itself, remembers to beat. My quiet, whispering heart beats more courageously, truer, stronger, braver. And then, if I'm lucky, and I'm heading in the right direction, I start to hear echoes of that heartbeat all around me. And I know I'm moving 
to a healthier path. So tonight here on the New Haven Green, I want to share with you a story of a circus that I joined. Turned out to be unhealthy, sadly. But a lifelong friend who I met there, and we were able to escape that circus together. Job description said, come get in line. If no traffic, I might make it in time. Some skills required I did not possess. Bravery needed, I would try my best. Well, hours later, they called my name. I prayed this would not be a big mistake. The tiger was tired. I was last in line, his big mouth opened, and I stuck my head inside. Mm -hmm. Oh, we keep moving, even when it makes no sense. No past, future, just present tense. The fighting pieces make amends. We are free to do our best. We let the highway do the Did not want the job, but I needed the work. Got a golden jacket, a red top hat, and a whip I knew I'd never use. I would not harm that cat. The big top caravan was a sight to see. The tiger and I became like family. But one day the ringmaster wanted bigger feet. He said I would have to use the whip because it sells more seats. This is when I realized it was unhealthy and I needed to get out of there. Well, we keep moving even when it makes no sense. No past, future, just present tense. The fighting pieces make amends. We are free to do our best. We let the highway do the rest. They locked the gates from the outside. But two giraffes gave us a ride. And we cleared that fence in the middle of the night. We fired up the hot air balloon and climbed inside. Just goes to show you life can take a turn. The tiger's really tall, so we got a convertible. Maybe we'll see you on the open road. He's a terrible driver, but he's trying to learn. And we keep moving, even when it makes no sense. No past, future, just present tense. The fighting pieces. circus that you're a part of that you need to escape I wish you the wisdom to know and the courage to go because when we leave those unhealthy circuses that aren't going to change it gives us much more time and space to be part of the joyful healthy and happy ones thank you very much